two guys, one Shaker Cup podcast, hosted by Joshua Shaw and Ryan Buckeye. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back inside another great episode of the Two Guys, One Shaker Cup podcast. You can finally find us on iTunes after they finally approved our uh, naughty name, Josh Shaw. We're on <laughs> iTunes, we're on, on Spotify, YouTube, and other podcast platforms. The man across the screen, if you're watching via YouTube, Josh Shaw from J. Shaw Consulting, myself, Ryan Buckeye from Fitness Informant. This has been fun so far, Josh. A lot of great feedback. We have reviews on the iTunes, and we encourage more people out there to write a review and, and click a five-star review if you like what you hear. It helps out the algorithm, helps more people discover this podcast. And uh, we just are hoping that we're bringing some content that people like to hear and then engage with on different social media platforms. And this week, Josh, we have a good conversation piece that I think is going to be interesting for many people because it's the way that we shop in general in the world. And the topic of conversation this week is if you or I were to start a supplement retailer, not a, not a brand, we're not making pre-workouts, but we're selling people's pre-workouts in a brick-and-mortar environment, not saying that has to be the only environment, but we're forced to have a storefront, how do you do it today and compete with the, the Goliath of Amazon, bodybuilding.com, and the 2019 trend of the year, direct-to-consumer? It's a great question. And it's a question that we look to tackle today. But I looked at Josh because you've consulted with many companies on topics of such. So what do you do, Josh? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult subject. I mean, initially, I think why we wanted to talk about this was because, you know, in your circle um, or just with the professionals that I work with, um, you know, this is a viable business. This is an ex a possible business idea that somebody passionate about health and fitness and supplements would be into. So regardless of all the bad or, or kind of like challenging things you see across the web uh, in terms of, you know, Amazon and digital and direct to consumer and all these things, you know, if you still want to do it, how do you do it correctly? And I mm -hmm. thought, you know, just us discussing this just because we have some, you know, our ideas maybe a little bit differ in terms of the way we look at um, the scenarios, but I think we can uncover some some good helpful tips. Uh, right. Maybe some also some discussions that maybe um, would be maybe deterrents or things that people aren't thinking about. Uh, and maybe if they do still go ahead with that business investment, um, they could you know do some positives with that. I don't I don't know. So, you know, I think for me. Uh, I, there are supplement stores that are still doing very well. Oh, right. In, and I, I guess it's relative very well, uh, comparable to the competition, but not maybe relative to maybe four or five years ago. Um, yeah, I was going to so say that. I was going to say that. I mean, for if, if a company started five, six years ago, they had a nice head start. Competition wasn't as fierce as it is today in the digital landscape. So today, I mean, and we'll have companies probably comment saying like, well, this is what I did to be successful. Well, that's what you did to be successful five years ago. But this is 2019. If you're starting from scratch, there's a whole new game plan that you have to lay out to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, no. And I think it's, um, it's there's a lot of headwinds that are going on. I mean, we talked about, um, you know, digital adoption, both from, you know, an Amazon that now, I think last time I looked, something like vitamins, minerals, and supplements make up about two and a half billion dollars of their uh, revenue and that's estimates because they don't really uh, break those numbers out but you know that is in terms of just digital um, that is let's see 10 to 12 times bigger than bodybuilding.com mm -hmm. which is kind of the next one and also probably the the next one's technically probably walmart's but um you know we you have you have Amazon, then you have all this business that you really can't uh, quantify. That's going direct to consumer, which is a ton of business. Um, so you have just those two players in general, but you still have all the biggest ones. You still have to deal with the GNCs, the vitamin shops, the the bodybuilding.coms. Um, you know those are really strong competitors still. Yet you also have some things happening with just. Foot traffic is down in retail. This isn't anything to do with supplement stores. This is, you know, these are malls. These are, um, you know, most businesses outside of a few that have, have kind of cracked the code. But most of uh, retailers at this point, you hear the term retail apocalypse always. Um, mm -hmm. That is, it's very real. So with all of this scary stuff in front of you, you know, 
why the heck would you take on opening a supplement store? I guess that's, you know, the first, you know, what, what type of person it's would sexy. be successful? <laughs> it's like we, we've talked about this. It's sexy, right? If you are a fitness connoisseur of any sorts, you've mentioned this. You have two options in life, like two ultimate end goals. If you want to be an entrepreneur, a gym or a supplement store, if you're lucky, maybe you combine them and have both. It's just a, it's like a sexy aspirational goal for people like, like, like myself. I've thought of opening a gym before. I've thought of starting a supplement store before. But I'm also realistic about it, and I also want to step. You know, you and I have a different thought process when we, you know, not not saying again that we're better than anybody, but we take time to investigate the opportunity before just diving in head first. And I think a lot of people just dive in head first. They don't know what they're getting themselves into. Next thing you know, they're breaking their lease, they're out of business, and then another one bites the dust. But I don't. I think to your point, you mentioned Vitamin Shop, GNC, Bodybuilding, all three big brands that you cover on your independent channel for Jay Shaw Consulting. You cover their earnings reports on a continuous basis. They haven't been positive. They continually be down versus last year. That's not to say that you can't be successful in this space. That just it, It's not an indication that the industry is dying. That's not an indication that you can't start a brick-and-mortar location and be highly successful. You can. You just need to do it differently or embrace things that – my biggest thing is like if, if you're going to ask me, like, what do, you, what do you do, Ryan? I first off – I stop complaining about the competition – I find out what they're not, what what needs they're not fulfilling for the consumer, and how can I fulfill that before I even open and turn the lights on? Like, how can I set up my business to fulfill a white space or fulfill a need of a consumer that's not being met by Amazon? There's no personal connection with Amazon. Bodybuilding likes to say that their customer service or their customer education team is the best in the industry. I would challenge that. I would have a conversation. I would chat with them, and I bet you I know more than most of them. Tiger Fitness has some really cool stuff. I mean, all these different places have some really good stuff, but not everybody does everything well. So what can you do, and is it is it feasible to open a independent supplement shop within a, say, Austin, Texas, a big metropolis like or Minneapolis, and be successful? And what I think is great is you've actually consulted with retailers. You've consulted with brands who complain to you on a regular basis about retailers and their pricing and everything else. Like we cover it daily on social media. So you have a a really good perspective on potentially maybe how to be successful. And I would love to see, like, where would Josh Shaw start if he was going to open up a traditional brick-and-mortar retail location tomorrow within the sports nutrition industry? Last three or four years, I've had, you know, some dealing, some clients that are in the, you know, supplement store, the physical retail sense. Um, Some small, some, you know, medium regional ones, and then, you know, ones that are much larger. So... I have a pretty good understanding of just the landscape, like what they're dealing with on a normal basis. And I've had an opportunity to work a a few times with, you know, opening new locations, like what, what goes into that. And I think what you talked about first, I think this is, that's imperative. I think you need to understand like, what are you going to add value to the, to the, you know, consumer? Like Mm -hmm. what, because you have to have a reason why they're going to shop with you over anybody else. Because today, there's just so many, you know, there's so many things that, uh, so many places people could spend their money, uh, brands, retailers, whatever. there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of, um, you know, substitutes. So you need to figure out how are you going to differentiate yourself. So that's kind of first and foremost. But outside of that, you have to go in and be kind of a student of, this whole world. Like it, it sounds fun. It sounds cool. It sounds like something you'd want to do, but you also have to treat it very seriously because as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of headwinds that are going against physical retail right now. So going in, you need to be able to manage some things that you can manage. There's some things that are going out there. Like we talked about with like foot traffic and, and some macro trends that are happening that you can't control. So what can you control? Mm -hmm. One of it is a lot of it is around like some of your fixed costs, which is, um, you know, like your rent. Yeah, um, yeah. And a lot of that comes down to like, where do you put the supplement store? Rent, you know, rising economy is strong, both from, you know, residential and commercial kind of real estate perspective. So you're having these fixed costs that are very real are, are something you can manage. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you need to look at, you know, geography, like where are you going to put this supplement store? Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways you kind of look at things. I think with a physical storefront, you want to make sure there's a, a good amount of foot traffic. 
um, you know, how, you know, on a certain street, how many cars go by, um, you know, what is the uh, median income of the people that are in that um, town? Right. Uh, what, you know, also just like comp competition, how many other supplement stores are there? There's a lot of things like geographical that you need to look at that has to go with both costs, but also just like, what's your potential? Because mm -hmm. you need to build you need to build a model. You need to build like a financial model to understand where your cost side is at and then where's like the the best, your average and your worst scenario for your potential on revenue and see if you can make sense of it. Right. Um, I think that's kind of the first step that anybody looking at any type of retail, it doesn't matter if it's supplement stores or not, needs to do some just a little bit of modeling. And this isn't like you need to get into statistics and you know have an MBA and all this kind of stuff but you need to make some strong budget yeah. uh, guesses you know you, you need financial considerations like, before you turn the lights on or sign a lease at least you should I mean it's the responsible thing to do as a business owner to at least understand like can I actually make money after I pay rent after I pay taxes after I pay for this product from sales reps like what's my margin markup and how much do I need to actually sell to be able to a like you mentioned, pay for this lease, pay for the POS system, pay for my employees, all this stuff. You know, it's interesting, too. You mentioned foot traffic, and I had a conversation with a couple of complete nutritions up in Minneapolis, and, and they were telling me their foot traffic was anywhere from, like, 12 to 20 a day. And I was like, how do you, how do you make money? I mean, 20 people a day, that to me, just uh, without knowing financials, does not seem like a lot because 20 people are not buying 100% of the time. So how do they keep that, you know, how do they keep that model going? And I always think about when we talk about brick and mortar and foot traffic – for whatever reason, my mind always goes to the Apple store because that place is always packed. Like if, if you want to go to get an appointment, you have to set an appointment. You're waiting two hours. There's people constantly playing with the gadgets. How can you incorporate the Apple store concept within the sports nutrition world? Because that drives people because you can buy a Mac online. You can go to Apple.com and buy a Mac online. You can buy a Mac on Walmart.com. You can buy a Mac on Amazon. But their foot traffic is unreal. And it might be because it's off. They feel more of an authentic experience going to say an Apple store that that could be part of it. But like, how do you embrace things that retailers do outside of your world? Like, uh, I, 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 this might be a bad example, but like Nordstrom's has like personal shoppers and people who really provide value because they can pick clothes out for you. And it, basically a supplement retailer can do that too. They can help. They should be able to help suggest what you should be taking based on your goals. Now that comes with, with an education platform. But I mentioned earlier too, Josh, like do the things that the others aren't doing but also do the things that they're doing well. Like how can you take what Amazon's doing well, which is pretty much, I mean, in that case, it's one day free shipping. So you can literally give the product to the consumer on the way out. But what does, what does bodybuilding.com do well? What does tigerfitness.com do? Like what do these other retail locations do well that you can also incorporate into your brick and mortar model? And you and I have talked about ideas before, like click and, cl click and collect. And this was like Back in the day, we talked about this, but where if those aren't familiar with it, essentially you buy online, you go to the store to pick it up. You can do that in a brick and mortar location. You could start a clicking. You could have a digital presence and still have your brick and mortar location be sort of your warehouse and your storefront. Like I don't see that natural body. I'll, I'll give a shout out to him because we did talk about him earlier. Like he has a, a digital presence and a physical retail presence in, in New York, that area, and he does very well for himself. I'm shocked to see more not do that and i don't know and you might be able to know this more than i is it because they have a lack of understanding of the digital world or is it because of a cost thing because yes there is infrastructure that you have to set up to integrate with your on-site pos and your digital pos to make sure that they they speak to each other to make sure you have things correctly like what's the biggest challenge or what's the big what's the biggest issue with supplement retailers not doing that there's a layer of technology that goes into it and it's mostly around like inventory control um, because a physical retailer usually doesn't have a account like an active account like if something sells there's a lot of times there's not that uh, you know kind of connection that goes the whole way through the system so if you're running both a digital website that would be having sales plus a store or multiple stores you would need to know where everything's at. You need to have everything tagged appropriately. So you might end up selling something somewhere that you don't have, or uh, somebody's going to drive somewhere. And that's probably the worst case scenario because they're trying to save time. They're trying to, that's, that's supposed to be a plus to your business, but then you just created a, a mess that could hurt some things. So you're only really seeing that 
from the biggest companies that are kind of instituting this. And there's also kind of like a spatial like thing within the store. Um, you need to have the store set up in a way that it enhances that, um, you know, click and collect or even, you know, take it another step if you want to do like on-demand delivery or you mm -hmm. have a delivery driver, like they, the, that delivery company, say it's Instacart or Postmates or something, they need to have a certain way they're set up to be able to quickly get in and out to get what they need. So sometimes supplement stores are not set up correctly for that. That's just n never been a thought of their mind. A lot of retailers, they just have not thought about that before. You see that in restaurants a lot. Like if you go to a chain restaurant, they were set up a certain way, but now they have certain sections where you pick up the item, the food items for pickup or the food runners pick up things. So they've everybody's trying to adapt. So a lot of it's coming down to probably adapt adaptability as well. Just you're used to working in a certain framework and now all of a sudden there's a new variable that got introduced and you're a little bit hesitant uh, on how to do this. I think that retailers have, I mean, especially supplement retailers, I mean, I can remember this, uh, when I used to do a bunch of demos and things at like vitamin shops and GNCs, a lot of people would call in and say, hey, can you set these aside for me? I'm sure. going to come in in an hour. So it's like the old school, like the early age of the uh, click and collect, like the call into the store, have the store associate go pick it out, and then you come in an hour later. So you had this happening before, but just before kind of the technology advancements, I right. think that, um, you know, it's just a, a different way that they have to integrate it now with websites and people wanting to have everything you know, streamlined into into digital. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if that's available to, you know, some of these smaller ones, you know what I mean? They, they might still have to operate off of that older analog system. Sure. I mean, you can like, so Shopify, WooCommerce are very popular e-commerce platforms, but they also can adapt into a brick and mortar location too with they offer scan tools and, and different things that you can incorporate to your WooCommerce inventory system. I think it's a mistake for anybody to start a brick and mortar location in 2019 and not be thinking digital and how can they incorporate the digital world into their brick and mortar location. I, I think if if they have blinders on, like if, if the only digital experience they have is using the internet to research competitors and look at what the e-commerce places are going to do, they're gonna they they're potentially gonna fail. Like you need to incorporate some of the things that work in online shopping into your brick and mortar location. And that's ultimately I mean, we talked about like how do you succeed in today's environment. I mentioned like look at white space, whether it was online locations and other brick and mortar locations, under serving, how can you over serve it, incorporate things that they do well. And you have to be thinking digital at the same time while having a brick and mortar location. I, I just don't think you can open up a storefront, or at least I wouldn't. I would never open up a storefront in the supplement industry or any retail location industry today. Not have a website, have inventory even on that website where a consumer can do the click and collect model through my inventory system. Okay, it's another it's another task you have to manage, which sucks, but that's all part of being an entrepreneur. Like it, no one said it's easy. So if you have to scan in the inventory when it comes in and make sure that that's correct, that's part of doing business. And and you know we have to you have to keep inventory anyway for taxes. Like it's part of the requirement to to report what you have on hand in terms of inventory. Now, be it smaller retailers don't have to do it to the extent of some larger ones where you actually have inventory specialist teams come in and do it for you. But it's like the smart thing to do. I feel like and if it's possible, like you mentioned Instacart, and I think that's genius because I actually were, I was thinking about hiring your own delivery driver, like having somebody in the store that could hop out in their car and go deliver it. But if Instacart, you can be incorporated in an Instacart or, or Peapod platform like that, where somebody can make an order, they'll pick up their creatine monohydrate, their their five pound bag of protein, and take it to them. That's actually kind of genius. And I mean, they they can do it at Walmart. You can buy the stuff at Walmart. So if you can offer that on those platforms, which are growing platforms, why not? Yeah, and I think it gets a little bit more interesting. The idea gets more interesting when you consider that a lot of the sales of these physical supplement retailers are moving towards what would be more considered like grocery items or like fast moving consumer goods like energy drinks or yeah. protein bars or like quick consumption products. Now, it's kind of a double edged sword of, of convenience because you want to utilize or you should be utilizing those convenience items to get people in your door consistently. The mm -hmm. more you can get people in the door to buy one or two at a time, the better chance you have to upsell them into something else where right. maybe they catch their eye and they get a $40 pre-workout or protein item or something like that where you have more margin on it. But you also have to balance that with 
what the customer wants, uh, like how do they want to transact with you? Is it, do they want to be convenient and they want to have something delivered to them? So you have to have that, you kind of have to be everything to everyone in a retail sense, like how somebody wants to shop, you need to be there for them. So if they want to shop online, they want to shop in the store, they want to uh, have it delivered, they want to, you know, whatever that is, you need to serve that customer the way they want to be served, or you potentially lose that sale because there's so many substitutes. There's so many options that they can go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So why do they continue to work with you or buy with you? Right. Yeah. I mean, you're hundred percent correct. It's just like, you think of Amazon's ability to ship something within two hours in large markets Two hours. That's, that's, that's insane. Like it's absolutely insane to think that this large company that Amazon is, if I want a pre-workout and it happens to be in stock at the Shakopee warehouse, which is literally 10 minutes from my house, I can have it delivered to my house in 25 minutes. Why would I ever leave my house? So as a brick and mortar location, you need to give me a reason to get off my lazy ass, drive there if that's the case, or if I can buy it via Instacart and get it, you know, that's the, I mean, that's, that's the benefit of Amazon is the prime, like getting something tomorrow or getting it in a couple hours without having to leave the comfort of my home. So that's why I say, if you're going to open up a physical retail location, whether it's supplements or it's apparel or whatever it is, like you need to a serve the underserved. And B, incorporate the things that they do well. And then C, like you have to think digital in a physical retail store sense. Like you have to incorporate it. And you mentioned before, Josh, like you need to do the financial models. Like you need to be smart. You need to, you need to put your businessman, businesswoman cap on before you apply for a permit, before you sign that lease. And you say you need to understand like the financial implications. Like is this possible for me? Because – if you if you don't want to work twenty four seven, you're gonna to have to hire employees. There's an additional expense. So I mean, there's there's so much that goes into it. The foot traffic thing, the location. I mean, if you could, if you could, if people listening to this podcast could see what goes on in the Walgreens real estate team. You'd be amazed at what some of these big these big retailers have. They have an entire real estate team that do reporting on demographics within the area. I mean, Walgreens. I use that because they're they're very big with their prescription drug model. But I don't know if you've ever seen like how they work and what they do. But I mean, it is a, it is a process down. That, like they make sure that if they build a store, it's going to be successful. Like they don't fail, and they don't fail because they do all the right things when they do their consideration set. Yeah, I mean, it comes back to being, being able to manage what you can manage, um, and then after you have kind of that set standard in terms of what you can manage, then it's all about what can you add that's not going to. Um, you know, take up all the variable margin left. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are the what are the other things that you can do best um, to meet some of the expectations that a customer wants from, uh, you know, we talked about it with like shipping or, um, you know, customer service. That's another kind of piece. Like if you're going to add technology layers, I, I would suggest, you know, looking at just ways to track your customer. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to know like a supplement, this maybe gets lost sometimes that, a nutritional supplement is very much a goal-driven intent purchase. Like yes. you want to get in shape. You want to, you know, help with your health, the diabetes, whatever it is, there's something that's causing you to buy something. You're not just buying it because a salty snack mm -hmm. or, you know, a tasty beverage. And, and so if you had the trackability of your goal, the goals of your co consumer, like have some ability to understand like, hey, what did – this person by last time, how did they do? How did they like it? You know, some type of data, purchase data that a lot of these very large, like a Amazon or has the ability to have. Can you do that in a way that's going to add some extra benefit to your business? Because I'll tell you this, like if I don't know anything about supplements and I go into your store and you are helpful and you're going to, you know, add a service level, you're gonna be great customer service. But I buy something and maybe I had some decent results, uh, maybe not, to, but you are willing to help me through it. Like you're, you know, you have some suggestions based around maybe some data, not just like your opinion, because um, that is a new piece of the world now. People are used to algorithms, data, you know, it, it's all around us. So just a suggestion from one person, maybe not as powerful as maybe a suggestion based on some some different sets of, of customer data or purchasing data or mm -hmm. whatever it is that you can pull from. All these are available. These are options that you could do. I'd say that not a lot of people implement that. No. Um, 
from a cost reason, from a they maybe they don't know it's available, um, or three maybe it's just like over their head, like they just they're doing it all like maybe on paper. It all comes down to like like it's analog or digital, and I think that yeah. you're gonna see like if you could scale the unscalable and you can use you know digital to do that, it makes your job easier to be able to focus on some other part of the business. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because the more that you try to take on and you try to do like the old school way, the less you have time to do all the other things that are going to separate you. And you have to be exceptional to win in retail now because you have all these things that are happening around you that you can't fix. Yeah. So yeah. if you're not exceptional, like why would somebody shop with you? Mm-hmm. I think it's great. I mean, every uh, the entire time you're talking, I'm just thinking from my digital mindset, like a rewards program. You get the rewards number. It's attached to a customer profile, which is attached to an email, which is attached to an IP. You can remark it on Facebook if they just purchased a pre-workout and say, hey, we have a buy one 50% off sale coming up on pre-workouts. Get them back in the store to increase foot traffic. I mean, that's it. You just need to have the model figured out if you're listening to this. It's just... It sounds complex, and it is. If you don't live in this world, I get it. Like, it is a lot. And even for someone like Josh and I who do a lot of stuff digitally via YouTube, podcasts, we both have websites. I run a WooCommerce platform too. Like, it's a lot. It's a lot for one person to handle. But these are things that you can incorporate to make sure to ensure the likelihood of success is much higher because I don't know what the likelihood of success is for a supplement retailer. I know. Isn't like the likelihood of success in like the restaurant business less than three percent or something? It's like astronomically low. Like I, I know the numbers. Like to be successful in that space is almost impossible. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's low. And I I think and gyms are the same I mean, way. I know gyms. Yeah, I mean I, are, are are extremely low. Yeah, I think because you're a lot of those things, and this is you know the idea of like exceptional, but like the more competition, the more substitutes you have, you know, like a restaurant, there's so many different, um, you know, types of food or, you know, maybe fast casual or just, you know, fancy or all these different things, but there's, they're all technically substitutes. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? It's food, it's energy. Um, and in the same sense of gyms, same thing, like you can't really differentiate gyms outside of maybe culture, maybe some equipment, uh, you know, things, but again, a lot of substitutes in a supplement store as well. It's like, there are a lot of substitutes out there, and they're just more and more happening by the day uh, because digital is kind of knocking down all of the advantages that physical retail has. So the success rate is is low, and you have to go in being realistic about that. I think that's kind of the important thing because, yeah, I mean, this could be a cool, fun lifestyle business for you. And I say lifestyle, not from you know ghost lifestyle, cool and hip or whatever. I'm talking like you don't hire employees, like. You you live in the store. You maybe make eighty to one hundred thousand dollars a year, which is a very good living. But you're in that store every single yeah. day, and that is your life. Now that might be a very good option for a lot of people, and they might enjoy that. They might want to do that. Do you want to do that for five years, seven years, ten years, fifteen mm-hmm. years? I don't I don't know. So for you to be able to move past a lifestyle business and into an actual real uh, scalable business. You need to get it, you're gonna to need to implement a lot of the stuff we're talking about technology um, utilizing you know social media and, and digital and things for marketing and and this isn't I guess I want to pump my brakes a little bit here because I think that a lot of people think if you just post on your Instagram <laughs> or you know your Facebook with a hundred followers or 200 followers you're you're doing marketing yeah. remember this is still a physical local business. Though you might want to attract every once in a while, maybe a regional sale, a national sale every once in a while, just to kind of grow that out a little bit. Maybe you have aspirations for more, but you are still going to do 90 plus percent of your business locally. So you need to get out, beat the streets, do the stuff that you you know you see people doing. Uh, you know, if they are like a financial advisor or an insurance broker, or like those people know everybody in the town. Mm-hmm. They go buy donuts. They go like. Maybe you don't want to buy donuts because you're a supplement store, but like maybe protein, like there's all these things you could be doing to like enhance your visibility in the community and more people in the community know who you are, the more willing somebody's going to spend money with you because Mm -hmm. they know you people buy from people. People don't buy from brand. You know what I mean? It's like, can you get that humanistic approach? Like if somebody knows Ryan owns Ryan's supplement store and I know Ryan, even if Amazon is two or three dollars more, I have a better chance of going to Ryan because I know Ryan's going to use that money to 
um, you know, put his kid through daycare right. or whatever. You know what I mean? There's a there is that community aspect that's still real. The problem is a lot of people have forgot about that. They've translated social media community as real community, and right. that's not going to work in physical retail. Yeah, I mean, you're 100% correct. And I, and I also don't want to say, like, you have to implement technology. You have to implement a website to be successful. Like, you can still be successful doing old school business, but it's going to be very hard, and it's going to have to be the right, the right situation. Small market, like to Josh's point, you know a lot of people in that town. People trust you. They know. I mean, you can still survive. You can still, you can still win, make a, a, an okay life. You're just not going to be able to give yourself the freedom that you want to take a week vacation because in your point, Josh, if you're living in that store and you want to go to Florida or Disney for a week with the family, that's a week you're not making revenue. And that is a lot of money for a lot of people. So, you know, as we wrap things up here in the podcast, really to be successful. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be sports nutrition. I think Josh and I are really on the same page here. It's like you need to you need to implement technology. You need to be comfortable with it. And if you don't, you need to learn it because it's only going to help you. And if you're able to get reoccurring sales and increase that foot traffic into a physical brick and mortar location, like that is the only way to make a living in a brick and mortar location is to make sure that foot traffic is there and people come to your store. Unless you're going to offer delivery via Instacart or whatever, like there's that option too. But these are just things that you should think about before you, you, you dive in head first because a bad investment is opening a gym or opening a supplement shop with basically no thought behind it. And you need to put that business thought behind it. And I think that's that's an issue with the space because it's an aspirational dream. It's an aspirational target for a lot of people who enjoy health and fitness. And this is not a knock, but those who really enjoy health and fitness sometimes just don't understand business. And if you don't understand business, just because you love something doesn't mean you're going to be successful at it. Because passion doesn't always translate to success. It can help, but you need you need some thought and some intelligence behind it as you dive into something you're passionate about, because that's going to increase your likelihood of success tenfold. Um, I mean, because Josh, you and I, for instance, we would not be doing what we're doing full time if we didn't understand business. It just wouldn't happen. Yeah. I mean, there's, you could, you try to control what you can control and everything else you try your best to be exceptional at and got to be a student in the game. I mean, Mm -hmm. I, I, this is, this is real. This is not, you're not um, guaranteed success in anything in life. No. So if you are going to put your time, effort, passion, do all these things to do something, do it to the best of your ability and expand your mindset. Learn, you know, this is this should be the type of schooling that you enjoy because if it's around your passion, there should be no reason why you shut this off. This is something that should be extremely exciting for you to dive into because it's potentially letting you live out your dream. Right. So. If anybody's going to get something out of this podcast, uh, hopefully, regardless of, of what maybe even business they're starting, uh, that's that's kind of that point that we're both kind of talking about here at the end is that hopefully people put in the time, put in the effort, research, you know, learn, be curious all the time and, and constantly improve and realize that what worked today might not work tomorrow and, and that you have to constantly change because the world around you is always changing and the only thing that you can count on in this world is that change is going to come. So the more you can get comfortable with that, the better. Right. I mean, it's inevitable. Change is going to happen. And I guess you just need to ask yourself, like, do you want whatever this this passion project is, do you want this to be a hobby or do you want it to be your life? And that's really the big difference there. If you want it to be your life, you need to take it seriously. Do some of the things that we talked about. Implement that. If you want it to be a hobby – you know, then then a hobby it is. You'll 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 still be working for the man. So uh, we hope you appreciated this episode of the podcast. As it's posted on our social media platforms, our Facebook page, uh, via Twitter, etc. Go ahead and engage with us. Comment. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this topic in general or any topics we've talked about here on the podcast. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on iTunes, Spotify. If it's over at YouTube, we have a, 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 the big red subscribe button. You can't miss it. Um, and again, as always, if you enjoyed what you heard, run us a review. Help us out. Help out the algorithm so we can reach more people with the Two Guys One Shaker Cup podcast. We appreciate you all for tuning in this week. Until next week, I'm Ryan Buckeye. I feel like we're Anchorman now, and you can sign off, Josh. Sign off yourself. (laughs) And I'm Joshua Shaw. All right, y'all. Have a good day.